Grace and peace be with you. I welcome you to this worship service with the First United Methodist Church of Oakhurst, New Jersey. This morning, as we prepare for worship, I offer you a few words of announcement. Next Sunday, our church community will return to the sanctuary for its time of worship, and at that time, our online services will be adjusted slightly. Starting next week, each Sunday, we will record the worship service as it takes place here in the sanctuary, and after worship, it will be edited and then uploaded. It'll be available online at about one o'clock each Sunday afternoon. And since we won't be having vocal music for a while in our sanctuary worship services, the weekly online service will include an additional anthem and hymn, which you can enjoy in the safety and comfort of your home. Furthermore, we are researching upgraded technology and equipment so that in the future, we will be able to provide a high quality worship experience for all who worship with us remotely. We are committed to the spiritual well-being of our in-person community and our online community and are working to discern ways to deepen each of these ministries. For now, I invite you to join with me in the call to worship. May the Spirit bless us with hope poured out like water and flowing as the river. May the Savior bless us with discomfort at injustice and oppression. May the Creator bless us with imagination that we always find the world inspiring. Let us take this time in prayer together. Lord God, we continue to learn that this is a fragile world that you've placed into our care. And there are times when we are particularly reminded of our human frailty, needing your loving care through times of anxiety or illness. Touch us, Lord God, with your healing hands and your healing words that we might walk together through seasons of turmoil with faithfulness and trust. Loving God, what we desire is this, that the people will see not us, but through our smiles, our greetings, our helping hands, or helpful words, they might see your love reaching out and might be touched in a time of need. Keep us focused throughout this day on being your servants in our time or wherever this life might take us, that your name will be glorified. All that we are, and all that we have, Lord God, we offer to you. We offer you our hands, that you might use them in and through our daily work. We offer you our feet, that you might lead us to someone who needs our help. We offer you our shoulders, if you would use them to lighten another's load. And we offer you our voices, that you might use them to speak up for those in need. All that we are and all that we have, Lord God, we offer to you, and we do so even as we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
scripture reading is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 10. You are dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of the world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses. And we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. By, for by grace, you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you join with me in a responsive prayer? Lord God, we are baptized as individuals, yet called to live and serve together. The image you have shaped within us is mysteriously, incredibly, a reflection of your own being. Glorious God, continue to invite us to sink our roots deep into your love and holiness and to grow stronger each day in our faith in you. Amen. left me with that moment 
I began to be set free. That, I would suggest, is the power of water. It sets us free. Water, this ordinary substance that on baptismal celebrations we pour into a font, this everyday product that we sprinkle on a person's head, water is a means of freedom. It's a path for renewal. It's a vehicle for new life. The waters of baptism do all of this because in these waters, God is whispering, God is singing, God is actually shouting, I love you. You are my beloved child. Will Willimon says, baptism is the great divine show and tell. God takes water and says, here's grace, here is promise, here is life. Today at our outdoor worship service, we will be celebrating the baptism of one of our young ones. And for that child, in the gift of this wonderful water, God makes love visible. Unconditional, permanent, life-changing love comes into view. Now, why on earth would God do this? Well, by all indications, it's because God wants to be in relationship with us. God invites us to enter into a relationship, human to divine, unequal, yet partnered. And we call this relationship covenant. The waters of baptism are the waters of a covenant, a, a relationship, a, a mutual bond of promise and trust. Now, admittedly, we human beings seem quite incapable of keeping our side of this precious relationship. From day one, we human beings have blown it. Sin is inevitable, proving over and over and over again that we are incapable of staying true to God in all of things. We are incapable of keeping our side of the covenant. And perhaps that's why the entire story of the Bible could be depicted as a story of God's efforts over and over and over again to bring us back into loving relationships back into covenantal life, to life of commitment and trust. And we struggle, and the Bible speaks of that struggle. And yet the Bible doesn't stop with the story of our, our failure with this relationship, our struggles with it. The story of, of, God's, of the world's broken promise to God is not where the story concludes itself. The Bible goes on to tell the amazing story of God keeping God's promises, God's faithfulness to the covenant, God's healing of the brokenness, God's reconciling and saving love for us. Time and time again, the Bible tells us that although humanity broke the covenant and disobeyed God, God did not turn away. God is faithful even to a faithless people. God's deepest desire is to have relationship with us, to, to heal the brokenness that we keep causing, to recon reconcile us to God and to one another, to forgive sins, to bring us to salvation. And that healing is evidenced and made possible in the life, teachings, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. God has made an everlasting covenant possible through Jesus Christ. God in Christ makes a binding relationship of love possible despite our persistent failures. And this water is the sign of that relationship. Baptismal water is the sign that this is God's act, God's power, God's gift. This water declares that by God's choosing, we are God's own. We don't earn this. We don't merit it. The fact that we baptize even infants, these, these little tiny ones who can't read a book about the sacraments, these little ones who cannot respond for themselves to the many questions our ritual asks, these little ones who can't even say the word God, babies remind us that this is all God's gift. Young or old, it is a beautiful gift. But before you conclude that this means that this is just a nice, sweet ritual that we do, and isn't it all kind of lovely, it's a nice tradition, no. 
To think that would be to miss the entire significance of the water. We look at a person at the font and we are reminded that we are all helpless before God. We are all helpless without God. And when a child or an infant receives baptism, we know that we look at that child and we say, they're helpless without, without us in the same ways we are all helpless without God. In a child, we see the truth of ourselves, completely and utterly dependent on the God who loves us, which means that the church and the Christian life, for that matter, is more than saying, come, let's gather at the water. We are a nice bunch of people. Come and feel good about yourself. Together, we'll do lots of good. The church is so much more than that. In this covenant, we are bearers of a radical message. At the font, we acknowledge that while we may seek to be nice and we may seek to do good, we are also terribly needy. We are terribly broken. As, as one Christian puts it, I don't always feel like a child of God. I don't always look like a child of God. God knows I don't always act like a child of God, but I am one of God's children not because of what I do or who I am, but because God chose me. In other words, as the church, we acknowledge that we are needy and we are broken and we are deeply flawed and we are saved by God's act of grace in Jesus Christ. That is the radical message of the water. And because of our utter need of God, we rejoice that the waters of baptism are more powerful than the brokenness that life holds. The wonderful author Anne Lamott says, and I quote, most of what we do in our worldly life is geared toward our staying dry, looking good, not going under. But in baptism, in lakes and rain and tanks and fonts, you agree to something that's a little sloppy because, because at the same time, it's also holy and absurd, end quote. It's about surrender. Surrendering to all those things that we can't control. It's a willingness to let go of balance and decorum and get drenched. Baptismal life is a little sloppy when you think about it. Picture that water running all around. Imagine you are struggling with some big pitcher of water and it's huge and it's so much that it's a bit too heavy for you to manage. And you, you begin to spill that water and the water is, is then leaking into places you didn't expect and it's seeping into cracks and crevices and it's wandering way beyond where you can handle and you can't mop it all up because it's moving so fast. That's how it is with God's grace. With the waters of baptismal grace, God declares, you are my beloved child. And that water, that grace, seeps into every corner of our lives, even where something else might seek to define us. The waters tell us who we are and whose we are. How do you define who you are? Our work may try to define us. Our Families may label us, our, our old failures may haunt us, our, our culture of consumerism and materialism may make us feel large or make us feel small. Our well-ingrained messages from painful experiences might keep whispering to us or our fears can endlessly question our standing in life. Picture all those different things that try to define us. They're subtle, often kind of hidden, but they're each trying to determine who we, will, we will understand ourselves to be. And then in comes that water. And it finds its way to every crack and fissure. And it says, no, 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 no. You are a beloved child of God. First and foremost and forever. Forever. This water has forever power, which is why we baptize only once. In baptism, God is the primary actor. God's the one making the promises, promises of love and support and forgiveness and new life, and God does not break those promises. To do this act of baptism more than once is to imply that maybe God didn't get it right the first time. 
Now, naturally, we have many needs for reaffirming our response to this great gift, and we've got lots of avenues for that as a church. Throughout our lives, we, we need and have those avenues for saying yes back to God over and over again at different seasons, but we baptize only once because this is God's gift, God's doing, and God is faithful to what is promised. And what's being promised in this water is so powerful that even if we sprinkle just a little bit of water on a person's head, the fact is we're still getting drenched, drenched in God's amazing, never-ending grace. And it, it changes everything. It changes how we see the world. It changes how we see ourselves forever. It changes everything because the water has power. Think about if you've ever stood on the edge of the ocean and that power that you know that the water has power. It pulls, it tosses, it has beautiful, terrifying, marvelous power. The waters of baptism have that kind of power. Because of this power, this holy power, what we are saying when we come to these waters, what we're saying is really all about surrender to that power. We're saying we believe we cannot manage this life on our own. We are saying we believe in mystery, that there's more to life than what we can see or measure. We, can, we, we are saying we believe and we trust in promise that there's hope at the core of life. And we're saying that there is an uncharted territory for the journey of life and we need a guide, we need a companion, we need a purpose for that journey. When we come to the water, we are saying that we are thirsty for the power that this water has. We are thirsty for this way of life. We are thirsty for this love. The doorbell of a church in Columbus, Ohio rang one Friday afternoon and Glenn, the pastor, answered and he found a five-year-old boy there in the neighborhood, you know, just standing there in front of the door. And Glenn said, can I help you? And the little boy said, are you having church today? Glenn said, no, no church today, only on Sundays. And the little boy lingered a little bit at that answer, and, the, and his, his stance made it clear that he really wanted to come in. And after a moment, the boy said, well, can I come in and get a drink of water? I'm really thirsty. The pastor let him in, and as the boy gulped down some of the water at the fountain in the main hall, the doorbell rang again. And the little boy looked up from his stream of water, and he and as it dripped from his chin, he said, uh, that's my brother. He wants a drink too. And so the two children stood at this fountain enjoying this cold water and the older of the two paused and said, I like church. And then the younger brother grinned at the pastor and said, don't you want a drink too? The water is great. Yes, the water is great. We are thirsty indeed. So come, come to the water, this living water, and God will spell across our soul the word grace, G-R-A-C-E, indelible, irreversible, irrepressible grace. And we come out of the water like Helen Keller with awakened souls, alive in Christ all because of the water. Let us pray. By water and spirit, Lord God, you seek to saturate us with your love. In gratitude and awe, we journey as though traveling on a stream throughout our days, carried by your current of grace. Amen. We receive the benediction. Go now into life, knowing you are carried on a current of grace. Amen.